Xenophanes. Welcome to the second lecture for this class, and welcome to my house. Uh, I'm not sure how much you'll be seeing of it, but you'll be seeing it today. If you hear any uh, noises outside, that's because it's the 4th of July and there's a lot of fireworks in the neighborhood. Um, so hopefully you don't get too distracted. At any rate, uh, let's begin. Societies in the course of their development tend to acquire a whole set of things that they hold sacred and inviolate, a set of beliefs and values that they exalt above all others. In the northeastern Mediterranean in the 6th century BC, people largely valued physical strength and courage above all else. They worshipped the gods as the embodiment of such strength and courage, and they hung on the words of their canonical poets, Homer and Hesiod. These poets, whose importance to the early Greek mindset can scarcely be overemphasized, envision the gods as doers of great deeds, the contestants in great conflicts, and subjects of great and overwhelming emotions. So, if you recall, Homer is the author of the Odyssey and the Iliad, uh, epic poems, and Hesiod is the author of the Theogony, um, which is a story about the birth of the gods, and another uh, poem called Works and Days, um, which is a little more obscure and it pertains to everyday Greek life. The Greek gods were far more like Hollywood movie stars than like the Muslim or Judaic conception of divinity. They fought constantly, and they were sometimes guilty of the most atrocious and horrific crimes. Tales of outrageous 21st century conduct on the internet have nothing on Greek mythology. When was the last time you heard a news story about a father who literally ate all of his children, or a son who castrated his father and threw his genitals into the sea? Our next pre-Socratic, Xenophanes, had little patience for this kind of stuff. Born in Colophon, an Ionian city not far from Miletus, Xenophanes exalted intelligence of mind over physical power, and he saw nothing either exalted or admirable about the poet's reprehensible stories about the Greek gods. Timon of Phileas called him a mocker of Homeric deception, and Cicero said that Xenophanes spent his life attacking the arrogance of those who pretend to know. Xenophanes was fundamentally an iconoclast, although it is difficult to tell what he believed about the pantheon of Greek gods. It is abundantly clear that he thought the poetic foundations of Greek religion and education were rotten, a view that Plato, over a century later, would share. His opposition to epic poetry notwithstanding, Xenophanes was a poet himself. He wrote very skillfully, and his poetry became known for its blending of elegant style and perceptive commentary. He is one of the first authors we know of in the Western world who wrote about aesthetics, attempting to answer the question, what makes for good poetry? He was, in every sense of the word, a purist and he grieved at corruption and complexity in language. Poetry should be straightforward. It should honor the divinities. It should not describe what is vulgar or obscene, and it should aim at what the Greeks called eunomia, which means good governance or good law. Quotation. Cheerful men should first sing a hymn to the god with well-omened words and pure speech. When they have poured an offering and prayed to be able to do acts of justice, it is not going too far if you drink only as much as permits you to reach home without assistance. Praise the man who, after drinking, behaves nobly, in that he possesses memory and aims for excellence, and relates neither battles of titans, nor giants, nor centaurs, the fictions of our fathers, nor violent conflicts. A moment ago, I called Xenophanes an iconoclast. What is iconoclasm? Well, iconoclasm involves the destruction of images that are an obstacle to some important truth. At the onset of the Protestant Reformation, reformers claimed that the plethora of religious images in Catholic churches prompted parishioners to worship images, thereby distancing them from the true God who is invisible and only accessible through prayer. They claimed that Catholicism had become nothing more than empty religiosity and superstition. These reformers literally took up hammers and axes to destroy statues and paintings of religious importance. They believed that God could only be accessed by the diligent mind, 
and that imagery only obscured the truth about God. Xenophanes did not, so far as we know, take up arms against the statues of Greek gods. But he did undermine them in a rather significant way by undermining the rational underpinnings of Greek religion. He did this by asking where Greek ideas about religion come from. Are they inspired by prophetic visions? Did they spring out fully fledged from the head of Zeus, like Athena? Are they purely rational deductions from incontestable premises? No, no, and no. Far from being firmly established in a certainty divinely to be wished, Xenophanes contends, they are based on human speculations, and they are hemmed in by distinctively human concerns. Voltaire once said that if God created us in his own image, we have more than reciprocated. His sentiment is almost directly prefigured in Xenophanes, who roundly ridicules the anthropomorphism involved in Greek myths. Mortals suppose that the gods are born, have human clothing and voice, and bodily form. If horses had hands, and if they could draw with their hands, and produce works as men do, then horses would draw figures of gods like horses, and oxen like oxen, and each would render the bodies to be of the same frame that each of them had. The message is clear. Human beings imagine that the gods are roughly like ourselves. This is assuredly a failure of our imagination, according to Xenophanes. But the history of human psychology has suggested a number of additional reasons for it. First, by making the gods like ourselves, but more powerful, we can vicariously experience ourselves living lives of tremendous power and influence. We might call this the Superman effect, since it is surely one of the causes of our fascination with superheroes. Second, anthropomorphic gods provide a convenient excuse for our own moral shortcomings. If Apollo is a lying bastard, it can make me feel a little less bad about myself when I tell a little lie to my mother about whether my brother wants a share in the whip. Third, anthropomorphic gods help us feel like we can truly understand the universe, since the gods act on motivations not unlike our own. It's not clear how many of these psychological motivations Xenophanes himself had in mind. It is clear, however, what his antidote for anthropomorphic divinity was. Xenophanes proposed an austere and transcendent notion of the divine. He spoke of one God, greatest among gods and men, not at all like mortals in form or thought. The emphasis on one God might make us think this is a version of monotheism. But immediately, the statement is qualified, greatest among gods. There seem, at least, to be some other gods on hand. The most accurate word to describe this version of theology, then, is probably henotheism. See, I'm sure you already know what that means. But just in case you don't, henotheism is the belief that there is a supreme god that rules over the other gods of the pantheon. What does Xenophanes tell us about this god? Well, the god is, first of all, nothing like the traditional Greek gods. He does not have an ordinary anthropomorphic body, nor ordinary anthropomorphic senses. He is impervious to change. Always he remains in the same state, changing not at all. Nor is it fitting that he come and go to different places at different times. He is the source of all motion, apparently, though he moves not. As it says, completely without toil, he agitates all things by the will of his mind. Moreover, whole he sees, whole he thinks, whole he hears. Now this business of seeing as a whole is a denial that the God uses senses to see or hear. And thus, indirectly, an indictment on the reliability of the senses. Xenophanes' lack of trust in the senses is not only a foreshadowing of the next three millennia in the field of philosophy, it is also the first manifestation in the Western tradition of something like skepticism, or at, at the very least modesty, about the capacity of human beings to know things. He says, Of course, the clear and certain truth no man has seen, nor will there be anyone who knows about the gods and what I say about all things. For even if, in the best case, someone happened to speak what has been brought to pass, 
Nevertheless, he himself would not know, but opinion is ordained for all. This passage captures an insight that undergraduate students in philosophy often independently arrive at, at some point in their education, that knowledge is not particularly easy to disentangle from opinion. In fact, it's quite easy to imagine that any piece of so-called knowledge you have is just an opinion. Just imagine it proving to be false. If it proves to be false, then it was never knowledge in the first place. It was just an opinion. Xenophanes runs with this insight, claiming a proposition he surely hasn't earned through argumentation, when he says that we only speak truths by accident. The conclusion surely goes too far, but the epistemic humility of Xenophanes is refreshing. The views that Xenophanes had about nature, in contrast, are not particularly remarkable. He believed that the things around us are combinations of two things, earth and water. The earth and its clouds are the cause of the existence of all things, including the stars and the sun. The sun is a conflagration of many small fires. Aside from these views, he had a rather remarkable passage about fossils, which is worth appreciating. It is number 34 in your book, but it's of little ultimate importance. Far more important are the contributions Xenophanes made to the fields of theology and epistemology. In Xenophanes, we may indeed find a sort of forerunner to David Hume's dictum that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Moreover, in this context, consider Hume's intriguing insistence that it is an absurdity to believe that the deity has human passions, and one of the lowest of human passions, a restless appetite for applause. Right now, in some spare, simple, and utterly unconventional heaven, David Hume and Xenophanes must be sharing a beer. Xenophanes resists the temptation to buy into conventional beliefs that lack a firm foundation in our insights and observations, especially if these beliefs also lack internal consistency and moral uprightness. Here, we see a clear contrast between two notions of God. On the one hand, God is passionate, changeable, human-like, and morally fallible. On the other hand, God is impassive, immutable, austere, and upright. The imminent gods of ancient Greece, who demanded sacrifices, who hurled down their wrath, who slept around, were being examined here and found wanting. Xenophanes envisioned a new kind of God, transcendent in his detachment and tranquility. This vision of God surely had an impact on philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics. Moreover, many would claim that the God of late Judaism and Christianity resembles Xenophanes' God far more closely than it does the God of the Old Testament. One could chalk this up to coincidence, I suppose, but I suspect that the connection runs deeper. <laughs>